Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Fong Ming Wei from Taiwan. Welcome to the fourth section of the 2023 Spectrum Institute for Teaching and Learning workshop series. I would like to show my appreciation for your participation on behalf of the SITL board. In today's session, we will have two presenters who will talk about their knowledge and practice in relation to the spectrum of teaching styles. Each of the presentation will be div divided into two parts, which are 20 to 25 minutes of uh, presentation followed with five minutes discussion. So now our first presenter is Tom Madao from Belgium. He will talk about the reciprocal peer tutoring with basic life support. So Tom, it's your time when you are ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Tom Madu, and I will be talking, as was introduced, on the effect of content knowledge in teaching and learning basic life support using reciprocal peer tutoring. I will share my screen. If somebody could confirm this is visible, then- Yes, okay. we can see it. Good. Okay, that's great. Perfect. So thank you for having me. My name is Tom. I work at the KU Leuven in Belgium. I also work at the Vives University of Applied Sciences uh, in Belgium. And I've been working in physical education, teacher education for about 13 years now. And I, in the final stages of my PhD, I'm at the KU Leuven with Professor Iserbiet. As you can see, it's a pretty long title. So I will break it up in three parts and, and introduce all three of them. So I will shortly speak on content knowledge, on basic life support, and on the teaching style C or the reciprocal peer tutoring model. I'll start very shortly with basic life support. I think it's a skill that needs little introduction. Cardiac arrest is still a leading cause of death all across the world. And well, bystanders can play a very important role in case of out of hospital cardiac arrest, arrest to bridge that time gap between the cardiac arrest and the arrival of emergency uh, surgery. Now, in many countries, BLS or basic life support is part of the standards in physical education and is also taught by PE teachers. So it's a subject that is quite a common one in Flanders and actually all across uh, the world. All major organizations unanimously advocate for making this obligated during secondary education. And I think the importance of educational efficiency for BLS is shown very well in this graph. Um, the end goal is to increase survival. And this formula for survival states that survival depends on three multiplicators, the medical science being in the guidelines, um, the local implementation being well, the way we implement it in society. And well, the edu educational efficiency, of course, plays a very important role. And there's been quite some research into different strategies to teach this topic at population level. And two strategies that I will be using or will be talking about are the use of blended learning, which is commonly defined as the, the combination of online learning and face-to-face -face learning. And the second strategy is the reciprocal peer learning model, or as we know it from the book as teaching style C. Um, I will shortly introduce the instructional model. Um, I think most of us will be familiar with it. We'll keep this very short, but using this model, we put the student in pairs and we assign them roles as doer or observer. Sometimes helper is being used or tutor and QT, but the idea is that one, the doer performs the task and the observer offers feedback to the doer. And students switch roles at fixed times. As a teacher, you also, of course, have responsibilities. You're responsible for the subject matter, the criteria is logistics, and you are supposed to provide feedback to observers. So the desired direction of communications in teaching style C is shown as this, with teachers talking to observers and observers and doers interacting with each other. Now, when I 
show this to my um, students. I like to show them this image as well, which is that a teacher can only do as much as he can because there's many student pairs in your gym. In this case, it's a 22 students, which is a normal class size in Flanders. So we are assigning a lot of responsibility to these observers and there will be a lot of feedback in your gymnasium and a lot of it will be unguided by teacher, well, it will not be unguided by teacher, but the teacher will not be close to the observer when he is giving his or her feedback. So this is a, an image of what this model could look like. You see the doer practicing with a mannequin and we see the observer here who is using an instructional aid to provide feedback to the doer. Okay, so I would like to start very shortly with the question, what do we expect from these observers? Because it's it, it's actually quite something. It, it's, it's not an, an easy task. We ask them to know the criteria. So in case of BLS, it was, this would be knowing the different steps and the criteria of good BLS performance. We ask them to observe the doer's performance, compare performance against the criteria, draw conclusions, and communicate these results. This is not an easy task. And for this, we often provide an instructional aid. That's how we help the observers. Now, an instructional aid could be a tablet, as you saw on, uh, on the pictures, but it could be a criteria sheet or a task card. But oftentimes, we provide help to these observers to perform their task. And if you look at these instructional aids, they contain content knowledge on the subject that is to be learned. Now, content knowledge has been a topic of research with pre-service and in-service teachers for quite some time. It's a, quite an active line of research with contributions from, for example, Professor Philip Ward from The Ohio State University, or Professor Skim or Cole or, or Peter Iserwit, and so on. And what we are doing in this particular study is bringing some of the insights of some of the concepts of content knowledge with pre- and in-service teachers bringing them down to the role of the observer during reciprocal peer teaching. So I will shortly introduce two types of content knowledge, which have been used in research with pre and in-service teachers. Now, the first one is called CCK or common content knowledge, and it has been defined as the knowledge needed to perform. So in case of basic life support, the CCK would be knowing the different steps, and knowing the criteria of those steps, knowing what needs to be done to perform BLS well. Now, a second type of knowledge is called specialized content knowledge, and it has been defined as knowledge unique to teaching. And this could be, for example, knowing how to recognize and to address common errors. Now, you don't need SCK to be able to perform BLS well. You need CCK to be able to perform. You don't need SCK to be able to perform a procedure well. It is, however, shown that advancing SCK with teachers, pre-service and service teachers, has a positive effect on the learning outcomes of their students. So we might ask ourselves the questions, to what extent do observers need SCK? And second, in this particular research, um, how can we learn them SCK and can we do this online? So this brings us to the research questions of this particular study. Research questions are the following. What is the effect of online SCK instruction on the behavior of observers during peer learning? We ask ourselves, what is the effect on the behavior of doers during peer learning? And what is the effect on the individual BLS performance following peer learning? For this, we set up a randomized control trial with 77 undergraduate students. And this was during COVID, so we were wearing the masks and we were not allowed in secondary schools at the time. And our participants had an age of 19 to 21 years old. Now, this was a three week study, and I will try to talk you through three different weeks. First week was a week of online learning. Second week was a week of learning basic life support using the reciprocal peer tutoring model. 
The third week was a week of assessment, which was done individually. So let's start in week one. Week one, we had two conditions. And the first condition was half of our population who received a training focusing on common content knowledge. So focusing on how to perform BLS. So these students received an online training module where they learned the different steps, they learned the criteria, and they were tested on them, and they needed to complete this test before they entered the lesson in week two. Our second condition was a condition where the students received the same training as in condition one, but additionally, they learned how to recognize and address common errors. And we learned them online. I brought two screenshots on what this looks like. So for example, it's in Dutch, but the left screen is asking the students if these chess compressions are correct. And the right screen is showing an example of automated feedback. So the user assessed these compressions as correct, which they are not. So the training module is providing the feedback that there is a problem with the positioning of the hands. So this was our first week, two conditions, and this was the independent variable in our study. In the second week, we used reciprocal peer tutoring to learn this skill. So we put students in pairs and we paired them within the same condition. So students from condition one were paired with students from condition one, and the same goes for condition two. And we blinded the teacher for these conditions. So the teacher had let's say 10 student pairs in her class, then that would be five pairs from condition one, five pairs from condition two, but she was blinded to the conditions or to the purpose of the study. And then we collected data during peer learning and we collected data in a very, very detailed manner. We captured different streams of data on how students were practicing and how they were interacting with each other. And this video clip, I hope, should give an idea of what we did. So this is a video clip of one student pair that is practicing during peer learning. And as you can see, we see the doer practicing with the mannequin, and we see the observer who is standing here, and this observer is holding an iPad. The iPad is showing him actually CCK, showing him the criteria of correct basic life support. Now, the mannequin is connected wirelessly to a tablet computer that gives us an objective um, assessment of the quality of performance of the doer. So in this case, we see that the doer is making mistakes. He is, uh, the software with the yellow arrow is showing that he is not releasing the chest completely in between chest compressions. It's a very common mistake for boys to make. Um, the helper is holding the iPad, and the iPad is also recording whatever these two students are saying to each other. So we can listen in to what they are saying to each other, and we can hear whether or not this observer is actually spotting the error of which we, the software tells us that the student is making that error. So it's a very detailed way of having a look at what's happening in this student pair. So we collected video clips like this one for all students, and then we placed six second interval cues on top of them to allow for systematic observation and to collect data on the occurrence of errors students are making and on the occurrence of errors that are being recognized or not recognized by the helpers. So in the third week, there was an assessment and this assessment was unannounced, individual, using a validated protocol. So the third week, these students are, were coming to class, and one by one, they needed to exit the room, go to a dressing room where a mannequin was there. And they were asked to perform the BLS procedure that they learned last week to the best of their abilities. So this was our three-week program. Now, if we have a look at some of these results, we can start with some results on the observed behavior during practice. So what did the students do while they were practicing? And the first 
interesting finding is the fact that students from condition one who were only trained in CCK, they practice chest compressions without errors for 18% of the observed practice intervals. So this means 82% of the time they were making errors. SCK grade students were practicing error free a lot more. So they were practicing with higher quality. I believe this was a first interesting finding. A second finding is that we can have a look at the types of errors they are making. And we can report on how many different mistakes are they making or how many unique errors are these students making. And then we can see an image like this. This is the sum of all unique errors made within one condition. And we see that students who are trained online in SCK, they are making less unique errors, less different kinds of errors during practice. This is the dark bar compared to the ones that were not trained in SCK. And if we have a look on how many errors were spotted, how many different errors were spotted by peer tutors, then we see that students who are trained in SCK actually spot more different kinds of errors, more unique errors compared to students who were not trained to do so. When we report on errors being spotted, we always mean that these are errors that are being spotted rightly so that we see the software is making this error and the observer is interacting on it rightfully. So a look at results at assessment. We report on four clinically relevant variables of chest compressions. And these were also the chest compressions that were the, the topic of the SCK online training. These are errors with correct hand position, with adequate rate, adequate release and adequate depth. And then we see that the SCK group actually outperforms the CCK group on two of these four variables. So if we conclude, what does this mean? Well, first of all, we can conclude that SCK trained students practiced more error-free or without errors. And interestingly, they made less unique errors during peer learning. And this is an interesting finding as when students are making less unique errors, it actually means they are making less errors regardless of what their observer was telling them. Because if you count the unique errors, you only count the first occurrence of each errors. And the first occurrence of an error is always by definition has been without feedback from an observer. So I think we can conclude that SCK training actually led to doers making less mistakes directly because they were aware of what the common errors were. Another finding is that SCK trained observers spot and interact verbally on more unique errors. And concluding, SCK trained students perform better at unannounced assessment. So if we try to wrap this up for this particular study, SCK training prior to peer learning had positive impacts. It had positive impacts on different levels. It positively impacted peer learning behavior of students. And then we are talking about behavior of doers in terms of quality of practice and observers in terms of their tutoring behavior. SCK training also positively impacted BLS learning outcomes on a retention test one week following their training. Another interesting finding is that SCK could be trained online. I would actually dare to argue the case. It might be the best place to train this type of SCK. And I would argue that because if we make a well-designed training module, we can make a student assess maybe 60 or 70 or 80 different instances of chest compressions and providing them with feedback over, over a time span of 10 minutes. It would be very, very challenging to, to do that one-on-one -on -one in a real-life setting. 
the speed at which you can train error detection online is really, really high and can be automated fully. We are, of course, aware that future research will be needed uh, with different age groups as this was research with undergraduate students. Okay, I hope I stayed within my time frame. I thank you for your attention and I'm, of course, very happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Yes, so thank you, Tom, for your wonderful presentation. So everyone, do you have any questions or comments on this presentation? Or you have the same experiences of implementing reciprocal styles that you want to share with us, it will be welcome. Hi, Tom. Yeah. Uh, can you hear yeah. me? I'm Ben yes. here. Yes. Yeah, um, the reciprocal style has a, um, it's a very unique role for the teacher. I wonder during the interaction between the doer and the observer, is it? Uh, doer and the peer, what is the role of the teachers, predominantly the role of the instructors? I mean, apart from designing the online experiences, do they go around and help the observers to become better peer observers? Yes. Well, in this particular study, the teacher was used to using this teaching style. So she was instructed and trained on and used to addressing observers during teaching. And she had a full class of student pairs. Some of these pairs were from condition one, others were from condition two. She was not involved in the online training or the research design, or she was blinded to which students were from uh, which oh. conditions. So in that way, she just taught her class, as she always did, to the best of her abilities, going around and uh, addressing observers, trying to help everyone. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Tom, I have a question. Yep. Was any data collected on the teacher? In other words, when the teacher was present with a pair, did you look at the communication, the interaction that went on between the two, between the observer and the uh, teacher? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And the correct answer is not yet. We have a witness video of the lesson, so we can code it, but we haven't collected that data yet. So I can't say anything on that yet. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Appreciate it. Because th this interaction may have some impact on or, or some connection to what else is going on with the students too. Yes. Yes. In terms of design, we, we made sure that there was an equal amount of student pairs from each condition um, and she was blinded or the condition students were in. So she just went around and, and asked to the, to the best of her um, abilities. And actually she didn't, inter we asked her not to, to initiate contact with student pairs. So she walked around and she guided the, uh, the, the logistics of the lesson. So she queued the switching from observer to doer and so on. And if students had questions, they could ask her. But we did ask her not to actively initiate contact on the topic of BLS during teaching. So, but she did get questions and then she helped to the best of her ability. So it was, yeah, it was a real life study in, in that way. Very good, thank you. Yeah, also, I, I have a, a quick question. Yeah, Tom. I'm considering whether the undergraduate does their, their knowledge about the life support uh, knowledge and skills are the, at the same level. The knowledge on basic life support? Yes, yes. Their knowledge and their practice, their skills I, about, about the life support. Yeah. Okay, so we, we did not do any kind of pretest, but... Mm -hmm. um, we did exclude students that received training in a fixed period of time before the before the study. So, for instance, if a student was a a lifeguard or anything that that was trained in BLS, that student would have been excluded from this uh, from this study. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, thank you for for your presentation. It's a very wonderful present.
Yes. So now we will have our next presenter, who is Professor Maria Golders, who will share the research outcomes relating to teaching styles and self-regulated learning. So, Dr. Golders, you can start when you are ready. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you can somebody confirm if you could see if you can see my the slides? We can see the yes. slides. Very Thank clear. you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to everybody, depending on from where you are attending the session. I would like to start by thanking the Spectrum Board members for the invitation and also Oton for her uh, generous help uh, for the preparation. I have to say that I am not an expert in the Spectrum teaching styles. My area of research is uh, psychology of physical education and for youth sport. However, my office is next door to Nikos Digelidis one. So I'm uh, always informed about the recent developments uh, yeah, on the spectrum teaching styles uh, research and the uh, activities of the uh, Spectrum Institute. So, uh, as I said, I have always been intrigued by the psychological processes and the outcomes that are involved or induced by some of the teaching styles. So, in a, an early study, I had uh, students, fourth and fifth grade students, uh, being taught for 10 weeks track and field activities, either with the practice or the inclusion style. And then I looked at about their self-reported intrinsic motivation, task involvement, and work avoidance. So as you can see in the graph, students from the students that were taught with the inclusion style reported that they were more intrinsically motivated they were more task involved, they were less in inclined to avoid work during the physical education sessions. Some years later, I became interested in uh, self-regulated learning. This concept refers to the initiation by students of setting their goals and encompassing learning strategies, and most importantly, for today's presentation, recognizing and correcting their errors. So students who are self-regulated in their learning monitor, control, and evaluate their behavior. Clearly, monitoring and controlling learning behavior is facilitated by some of the teaching styles of the spread of the spectrum. There are some in the heart of uh, self-regulated learning, there are metacognitive and, and motivational processes. For example, self-observation is a key process where self-regulated learners pay deliberate attention to their performance. Equally important is the metacognitive activity of self-judgment, whereas the students compare their present performance against goals or standards. I assume that you can easily recognize that self-observation and self-judgment are facilitated by the self in the self-check style, which provides a structured method to the student to self-observe and self-judge his performance. However, the same, as I will show you later, applies to the reciprocal style. Finally, an important motivational process is self-reactions. For example, a student may be discouraged uh, if his 
self-judgment is uh, negative, whereas another one may be motivationally enhanced when his judgments are positive. So metacognitive monitoring refers to the mental tracking of one's performance process and outcomes. And when students are aware of their current level of performance, they set or effective goals, which may be realistic and challenging. And the self-evaluative judgments that students use clearly affect their subsequent learning efforts, as I explained before. So self-monitoring is a process that effective learners use to gather information for regulating their performance to achieve their goals. This process is most effective when the information gathered is accurate. And I will later show you some research we did on this aspect. I believe that you can see clear parallels in the metacognitive monitor with processes involved in the self-check and the, in the reciprocal style, whereas students have to compare their own or their peer learning activities to a standard, the self-check cards or the reciprocal, or the reciprocal checking cards they have. So this metacognitive activity is a critical for their subsequent performance and psychological outcomes. Now, one of the most applied models of self-regulation is the one by Zimmerman, who has proposed that the development of self-regulated learning proceeds through four distinct levels. These are the observation level, the emulation level, the self-control level, and the self-regulation level. And here you can see a brief description of each of the levels, specifically tied to the learning of motor skills. So in observation, at the observation level, students watch a model perform the skill and capture the performance standards. At the emulation level, students practice receiving social feedback either by the teacher or by any other agent. At the self-control level, students set process goals and self-monitor their performance. So they pay deliberate attention to some aspect of their behavior, which is a clear parallel to the procedure involved by in the self-check style. Finally, at the self-regulation level, students practice the skill in changing condition and apply and modify the skill if needed. So self-regulated learning develops through sequential practice of the four levels. And it has been theorized that students who master each level sequentially will learn effectively. So in some of our studies, we showed that students who progressed effectively from the emulation level where the, they received feedback by the teacher and then proceeded to the uh, self-control level where they set process goals and self-recorded their performance, exhibited better performance, satisfaction, and increasing motivation in a number of physical education skills, such as the football pass, the basketball dribbling, the dart throwing, and the basketball chest pass. Now, as I explained before, 
at the emulation level, students receive social feedback. This can be either by their teacher or instructor or by their peers. And this clearly parallels the reciprocal style. At the self-control level, students set process goal and self-monitor their performance. This again parallels the self-check style. So in order to check whether the uh, reciprocal style and the self-check style the, the, the sequential progression from the reciprocal for better learning, we set up a study where fifth and sixth grade students formed four experimental groups. The first two group went through the first level observation plus the second level using the reciprocal teaching style. The second experimental group taught with the observation style and then proceeded immediately to the third level of self-control being taught with the self-check style. The third group was taught in sequence by the observation and then by the reciprocal cheating style and then by the self-check style. And finally, there was a fourth group which went through observation and then practice the basketball chest pass. All four groups had equal amount of practice. Our prediction was that the third group who observed the skill and then was taught sequentially by the reciprocal and the self-check style would outperform the other three groups. However, the results showed that students taught either with the reciprocal or with the self-check or with the reciprocal and self-check style all had better improve a larger improvement equal improvement and more so than the practice group so as i said before the reciprocal style also involved metacognitive activities which are critical for performance and then, so in order to verify this, an earlier study had shown that students who observed a model performing in a video, a model per performing a motor skill that was dart throwing with errors, and were taught to spot and correct errors, exhibited better performance in subsequent dart throwing tests, higher self efficacy higher satisfaction and more intrinsic interest. Therefore, our results of the previous, of the study I presented, shows that both the self-check and the reciprocal style involve important metacognitive activities which facilitate learning. However, we were interested to find out the, whether the accuracy of the feedback received, students received in the self-check style or the self-judgments they make in the self-check style affects their subsequent performance. Therefore, we set up a study to rate the ratings in the observation and the reciprocal and in the self-check style. So students were either taught with the reciprocal or the self-check or the reciprocal and self-check style. The content was the basketball chest pass. The rating cards included four criteria and three-point scale, and students provided 24 ratings during one physical education session with this content. At the same time, two experienced external raters were rating the students. So each student had 24 ratings for himself, either by himself at the self-check style or by his or her peer at the reciprocal style, plus two times 24 ratings by the external ratings. And then we calculated the recording accuracy as the absolute values of external ratings minus self or 
peer ratings. And our results showed that regardless of the teaching style, students were moderately accurate in their peer and self-recording with a tendency to overestimate their performance. However, and most importantly, students who received more accurate feedback or self-recording more accurately outperformed those who received less accurate feedback or those that self-checked inaccurately. So this is a graphical presentation of the results in a test in the chest pass, where is high feedback accuracy first either to feedback by peers in the reciprocal style or self-feedback by the self-check style. Clearly, the accuracy of the feedback is critical for learning. Then, more recently, we tried to set up a study for improving the accuracy of the feedback. Therefore, we set, we set up a study involving four physical education sessions, each one corresponding to each of the four levels of self-regulated learning. This was for the experimental group, whereas the control group was taught only with the first level and the second level, observational learning and emulation level. The content was basketball shooting skill, and at the self-control level and at the self-regulation level, students of the experimental group self-recorded their performance, their estimation of the performance in a test, in a basketball shooting test, repeatedly. And then they also recorded their performance. This led to an improvement in the accuracy of self-recording. Lower scores here denote a higher accuracy. Therefore, those students who repeatedly make estimations of their performance for a, in a subsequent basketball shooting test and then self-recorded their performance at the two levels, at the self-control and at the self-regulation level, improved their accuracy of estimation. And this is an indication that the self-feedback or self-rating at the self-check style can be improved. On a final study of ours, we set up to check whether the processes involved in the self-check style as they are involved in the self-control level of the self-regulated learning, may affect students' executive function. Executive functions refer to a group of higher-order cognitive processes which are responsible for effective adaptability and flexibility in goal-oriented behavior. Theorists acknowledge there is a wider acknowledgement that there are three core executive functions, those of inhibition, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. So we set up a study that students either went to the first two levels of self-regulated learning or at the first three levels of self-regulated learning, which involve self-recording and process goals. So our results showed that this was a, a randomized control group randomized control study, that those students who set process goals and self-recorded their self-recording their performance parallel to the process involved in the self-check style, improved their scores on a executive function test. And the improvement was quite significant, as you can see in 
the graph. Overall, the key metacognitive processes involved, our studies show that the key metacognitive processes involved in the reciprocal and the self-check style by observing one's self or other learning behaviors and judging one's self or others learning behaviors against standards facilitate learning performance estimation, which in turn facilitates learning again, and possibly executive function. So that's it from me. I would like to thank you once again for your attention. If anybody, if someone of you wants any of these studies, I'll be happy to share them. This is my email. And thank you again. Yes, thank you, Professor Gautas. Yeah, so questions and comments from the audience. I think I saw Kanae raise her hand for a second. I'm not sure. Sorry, I was just clapping hands. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. that was, well, I can make a comment. I don't have a question, but it's very interesting that you're connecting metacognitive process and self-regulation with spectrum teaching style. That's something that I think it's increasingly important in our society that our students and new generations are needed. So I think much more research on this topic will be important and they will get more, uh, will get attention to the, you know, physical education and sports teaching a society. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Professor Gotas? I would just have a comment for Professor yes. Gus, and it, it's number one. It's it's really important that, or it's it's really great that we have individuals like you who are tying different theories together, self-regulated learning, and how it really mimics or self-check in a reciprocal style. Really, are a part of that, and that's great. And I think the second comment I have is how powerful the data are from your studies to support these two instructional structures, the reciprocal style and the self-check teaching styles. So excellent. Thanks for your research, Professor Gudas. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for your comments, Mark. So anyone who have further questions or comments, I guess my question is, sorry I've missed if I missed that information and if you presented it, but what would be your next step and future direction in terms of like related to this topic? In the study, we tried to enhance the accuracy of estimation. The estimation was for a sport test where you have a clear target. For example, eight out of 10 successful shots. However, we haven't tried to improve the accuracy of feedback in the reciprocal style. So I think this is critical to apply some method to improve the accuracy of feedback because accuracy is a uh, critical for performance. So perhaps we could set up a study for providing feedback on feedback. So observing students in the reciprocal style, providing feedback to their uh, peers and comment whether this feedback is accurate, trying to improve the accuracy of feedback. Good. Thank you for the responses, Dr. Gotes. Yeah, I, I think time is up and yeah, we, we are going to close this section, but it's a very good evening to have all of you stay with me. I really sin sincerely to say that and uh, with two good presenters and wonderful discussions with all of you. So I hope you have a good weekend and look for for forward to seeing you in our last section of workshop series. <laughs>